and um, welcome everybody. Very good afternoon. It's unusual that we've got a meeting on Tuesday. Recording just started. Thank you very much for all of you to agree and be available. Uh, we've got a special guest today, Mark Charman from Faststream with us. But before we allow Mark to speak, let me just go through everything we have prepared for, for ourselves today. So uh, starting with apologies, uh, Mark O'Neill, our president, could not be with us today. Uh, he sends his apologies and asked me to, to act on his behalf. Now, what was happening over the last two weeks since our last meeting? Um, Ukraine continues, although I believe we all have the situation under our own controls. Um, we have been contacted by our Ukrainian colleagues who are still telling us that we do have Ukrainian seafarers available. If any of you is short of Ukrainian seafarers, we do have those who are available and uh, allowed to, to leave country. Therefore, please, please, please get in touch. We also continue helping families of Ukrainian seafarers um, coming out of Ukraine, but also being relocated. And it is mostly in Poland at the moment, although we do have two families relocated to UK and I'm working with those seafarers trying to find them jobs in UK. Um, another issue which you probably saw my messages and uh, have been somehow involved is a sad news, really, really sad news. We continue to kill people in enclosed spaces. Maybe good news is it's not our member who suffered recently, but um, first accident this year, it was 9th of May, two shore workers lost their lives. Then we have two seafarers on tanker, uh, riding squad, and on the 27th of June, we lost three shore workers in Indonesia on the Isle of Man flagged Balkaria. So Intermanager is the organization which is holding statistics. We had to do that. If you remember, you participated in 2018 in our excellent campaign when we asked seafarers and members were fabulous because we received 5,000 responses from your seafarers telling us why they killed themselves in enclosed spaces. And uh, we follow on this one. We are now working together with uh, Human Element Industry Group partners. Ima Rest and Martin Shaw, who is on this call, is extremely instrumental with that. And as a result, we decided that we cannot rely on GISIS and IMO alone. We had to take the statistics into our own hands. And now we do have statistics ranging back, uh, going back to 1999, showing that we had 98 fatal accidents resulting in 162 people losing their lives. So Intermanager is championing this issue, big style, and there will be more on this. And I would like to use this opportunity to thank all of you on this call who are participating in Enclosed Spaces project. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. And we have been working on EU ETS, and I'm glad to report that I will be sending message today or tomorrow where we've got our committee more or less uh, reaching the level where we are ready to ask members of Intermanager. And I would like to stress one thing, especially third party ship managers to have a good look at the definition of the shipping company and give it back to us. Now, I am being controversial, yes. Our paths are not necessarily parallel with ICS and BIMCO here. I would love them to be, but they are not at the moment because third party ship manager is not a ship owner. And we do, as an intermanager, have to look after, after third party ship managers. Therefore, please be a devil's advocate, have a good look at EU definition of the shipping company and be happy with it. If you are not happy, then tell us. This is the time to do that. After January 2023, it will be too late. So please don't think you are not being affected by what I'm saying now. Have a good discussion with your teams and then come back to me and say, yes, we are happy with this or no, we are not happy. We are at this level now, at this um, stage, then I do have people in European Commission able to talk to us. They are happy to listen to the third partnership managers on top of ship owners, and other parties. They want to know what we are feeling. They don't want to leave us 
Excuse me. My office in London is very close to London City Airport and you can hear it. Um, so um, European Commission is happy to to listen to us, but we need to voice our opinions. So please, I'm using this opportunity because that's what our 60 minute meetings are for. And that's all what I have prepared for you today. I will open the floor if there are any questions, any comments, any homework for me, then please raise your hand electronically. Preferably so I can see there is no yellow hands. There is nothing. OK, we will also have a time after Mark finishes with his presentation. Now, without further ado, I'm delighted. I'm delighted to have Mark Charman with us uh, and his team did a fabulous job going back to our members as well, but outside of third party ship managers and asking, doing a stock check basically on technical and other superintendents where they are, what they do, how much they earn and so on and so forth. I loved Mark's report. Immediately on reading it, I said, Mark, you have to come and talk to our members because they would really like to see what, what it is all about. So Mark, without further ado, please, floor is yours and I understand you will be sharing your screen. Yes, I will. Let's, um, let's get the technical bit done first of all and make sure that I can share my screen. Okay, Mark, yes, we can see. But I also hear somebody, Mark, hold on a second. Guys, please make sure that you are muted, except Mark. For the background noise, somebody is on the phone. Very good. So you should all be able to see a holding page with uh, the, the, head, the headline on it. Very good. So good afternoon, everyone. And Cooper, thank you for inviting me to uh, share the findings of this report with, uh, with your membership. So over the course of each year, we produce a number of different reports uh, looking at different elements of the maritime sector. Uh, this is a new report for us. We will repeat it next year, um, but this is a report specifically looking at superintendents. So we think it's the first of its kind looking at superintendents, and it looks at a number of trends that are important to the industry and important to superintendents across a number of different aspects. Uh, I'm going to attempt to give you an executive summary of this report, so I'm going to go through it really, really quite quickly. Uh, I'll take some questions, uh, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of discussion at the end of the report itself. And uh, I'll move through quite quickly, so apologies, it's going to go quite fast, but let's get stuck into it. OK, so first of all, this is a global survey, so we're, uh, we're based UK and Singapore. Uh, but we operate globally and so this is a global survey about 1300 people in the end 1300 superintendents completed the report uh, we've put everything in uk sterling we had to pick a currency it was difficult to, to get that to please everybody but as uh, a uk uh, headquartered recruiter we chose uh, sterling it was confidential and anonymous so we don't know who completed the report uh, we can't drill down on any of the answers on an individual basis it was completely confidential and as you'll see uh, it covers a range of vessels and different experience types first of all looking at the demographics of this so 58 percent of the, the, the superintendents are in europe uh, 10 percent middle east 25 percent asia pacific uh, and seven percent in the us that pretty much kind of reflects our view of the maritime sector and our view of superintendents as a whole. So global report covering uh, pretty much all of the bases there. Demographic, so how old were the people who completed the report? Well, we covered everyone, as you can see, in the different sort of age groups that we have here, but the sweet spot here really is in the middle of 40 to 49 year old uh, superintendents, 37% of the people who completed the report fell into that group there. But again, a good spray, a spread of um, age demographics that we covered uh, in terms of the, the actual superintendents themselves. I think going forward, what we're starting to see already here, and I'm not sure if you're seeing this uh, through your activities, 21% of those who completed the report were superintendents who were between the ages of 30 and 39. I think we'll see that, that number and that percentage increase over time. We're starting to see seafarers uh, coming ashore uh, younger. So I think the, the days of the seafarer who goes to, 
uh, see as a cadet all the way through to master or chief engineer, whilst we still do see that, we see this trend and have done for a number of years now that seafarers uh, are wanting to come ashore uh, younger. So I think we'll see that percentage increase in the demographics. OK, so we thought it was important to be able to look at the report by two things. One is the number of years of shore based experience that these superintendents have and also the vessel types uh, that they're actually having experience in and that they're working in at the moment. So you can see that the vast majority of the people who completed this report, 47 percent, have had more than 11 years experience in a shore based role. So you know, big experience group there, but also we can see that, you know, we've got um, those new to the industry as superintendents, less than a year's experience, making up 6%, kind of the up and comers, if you like, as the superintendents. If we look at vessel types, we've got a very even spread uh, across vessel types. Super yachts uh, is the minority here, which is again, uh, unsurprising. If you look at uh, tankers, you look at gas carriers, and tankers together, that's a big percentage of the superintendents who completed this. But again, we've covered all of the vessel types and got a good spread of, uh, of different people. We thought it was important to look at this and say, OK, out of the people who completed the report, what percentage of these people uh, worked for a third party ship management company and what percentage of these people worked uh, for an in-house for a ship owner? And you can see the 40-60 the split there between the two. But also to be able to look at those who had seagoing experience versus those who had never been to sea. And again, I think that um, we in, in recent years have started to see that percentage of uh, superintendents who've never been to sea in the first place, starting to see that percentage increase. Uh, and my prediction is that we will continue to see that percentage of superintendents who've never been to sea uh, continue to increase. And we'll come back to some of these demographics uh, when we start to look at how we sort of slice the data, if you like. Okay, so straight into salary. So we thought this was important for our audience, both for uh, the superintendents themselves, but also for the ship managers uh, and the ship owners themselves. So this is a mean average salary by region. Uh, you can see uh, America is much higher than, uh, than Asia Pacific and Europe. Again, that kind of reflects what we see as an industry, that superintendents, particularly in the US uh, and in Canada, are paid much more than superintendents uh, are paid in Europe and Asia Pacific. Um, we recently, or I recently was in Singapore, and I had a lot of questions here about the number here. Uh, 79,000 pounds as an average salary for Singapore because it seems low. Um, I think the important point to make here is that Asia Pacific, yes, Hong Kong and Singapore uh, are two big hubs that are kind of um, driving the numbers, if you like. But this also includes superintendents who are based in uh, Malaysia, for example, or superintendents who are based in Mumbai or in China. And so this is a regional uh, average rather than specific to uh, uh, Singapore and Hong Kong. We, we were asked by one of our clients in Singapore to drill down on that number and say, OK, what does that number look like for Singapore? The number for Singapore is much closer uh, to the number for, for America and the Middle East. It sits at about £86,000 uh, as an average salary in Singapore. When you turn that into Singapore dollars, I think that works out at about uh, something like 13 uh, thousand Singapore dollars a month, which is again, we think broadly in line with, with what we see in the market itself. So we wanted to then say, OK, well, what were the differences here between what ship managers were paying the superintendents and what were uh, what were the ship owners paying the superintendents? There's always this perception when you talk to superintendents that um, are working in third party ship management companies that the grass is uh, is much greener if I go and work for uh, for a ship owner. And whilst there are some differences, I don't think that the differences are actually as marked or as considerable uh, as perhaps perception might be here. I think the differences between uh, ship owners and ship managers, I think the differences are, with the exception of the Americas, um, somewhat negligible. I think, you know, OK, so we see in Americas, we see in the Middle East, but I think 
The Middle East number is somewhat distorted uh, through uh, housing allowances and car allowances that are paid as part of an overall uh, to total compensation number. Very well, we're talking about total compensation here. So interesting to look at it by comparison between the, the, the two groups of companies. So we wanted then to look at this and say, OK, well, how is this influenced by the number, number of years that someone uh, has worked in a shoreside role? Uh, and you can see the trend here, you know, for the people who have got less than a year's experience, at £65,000 as an average uh, salary for a superintendent, all the way through to uh, £82,000 uh, for superintendents who've got more uh, than 11 years experience. We've presented this probably now to um, maybe 20 to 30 uh, different clients so far, and we've uh, we've pretty much had feedback across the board here that these numbers are about right, with some, some companies uh, perhaps at the lower end of the scale paying less uh, for their superintendents when they first uh, come into their shoreside role having served at sea. But again, gives you some good benchmark numbers. We'll be able to make some comparisons to these uh, in a year's time when we come back to it and say, OK, how does this look and, and what are the trends that we see here? Okay, so we wanted to find out when did superintendents last receive a pay rise? So I think it's quite an encouraging number here that uh, in the last six months, 27% of superintendents have received a pay rise and 23% have received a pay rise in the last year. Uh, the number on the far right there, 26% of superintendents say, I've, I've never received a pay rise, I've not had one, you know. It, it's a, a big number, big percentage of superintendents. And when we come back to looking at, um, at engagement later in the report here, uh, the, the correlation between um, how superintendents feel and their level of engagement, unsurprisingly, is directly linked to when they last received a pay rise. You know, the, the boys and girls who haven't had a pay rise, as we're going to look at, they're really not feeling the love. You know, they're, they're, they're pretty disenfranchised. If you think about the companies and the sectors of shipping where perhaps superintendents have not received a pay rise, uh, like the offshore sector, for example, you know, the offshore sector for the last, let's say, the last three years have had it super tough. And so there'll be many superintendents in uh, that sector who've never received a pay rise. Uh, I presented this to a, a very large offshore vessel owner uh, recently, and they haven't had a pay rise in five years. Then if you think about the cruise sector and you think about COVID and what the cruise sector has been, or ferries, for example, over the last couple of years during, uh, during COVID, you can see that many of those superintendents actually also would not have, uh, not have received a pay rise in that period. So we wanted to look at well, what pay rises were people receiving, you know, so if you did get a pay rise, what percentage pay rise uh, were you receiving? Um, you can see here on the far left, 54 percent of, uh, of superintendents who had received a pay rise uh, had a pay rise of less than 5 percent. Uh, we've got that next group there, 33 percent of superintendents who would received between 5 and 10 percent. And then over on the far right hand side, we've got 6% of superintendents who'd had a big pay rise. You know, they had received a pay rise uh, of over 20%, which was you know, a huge pay rise. Uh, again, in presenting this to uh, different vessel owners and different segments of shipping, you think about it, for example, uh, the container ship owners right now, or you think about it perhaps um, the dry bulk sector and how well they have, um, they've done recently you can see that some of those companies are paying significant pay rises uh, to keep people. So nearly a third of superintendents that we looked at who actually work for third party ship management companies, they had never had a pay rise at all. And that was working in third party ship management. So that wasn't necessarily specific uh, to the cruise sector or specific to the offshore sector. This was a big group of superintendents uh, who've just never had a pay rise. Um, bearing in mind, again, this is a global survey, so this could be, you know, a, a superintendent sat working for a very, very small ship management company uh, somewhere in the world who hasn't had a pay rise, or it could be a superintendent working for one of the top five uh, ship management businesses. 
we wanted to look at benefits and bonus. We thought this, you know, this was important, particularly coming out of COVID. Uh, we thought the whole benefits piece was important to understanding better. Um, you can see here, many of these things are, are perhaps things that we take for granted. But 62% of superintendents are, are receiving a bonus. That's, what, that's a big, big group of superintendents there who are receiving that bonus. Um, still very, very much a hot topic with employers. The working from home uh, puzzle, shall we call it, and it is a puzzle because many organisations are tr still trying to uh, figure out how to address this working from home, this hybrid working piece. And we get asked a lot of questions still by, um, by employers about what do we see in the industry? What are other companies doing about working from home? How are they approaching it? Is it, is it hybrid? How many days? Is it formal? What are the trends that, uh, that we see here? So it's still very much a, a, a big topic. Uh, this concept of flexi time is interesting, probably means different things to different people, but it's an interesting topic. Uh, and surprisingly, 42% uh, of superintendents are getting not just private medical, but they're getting it for their family uh, uh, as well. So continuing with that, we can see here that 11% uh, of superintendents are getting paid over overtime, some are getting gym membership, some are getting things like personal development funds or car allowances. Quite a spread here of, uh, of benefits that people are receiving. Um, as part of our survey, we were also asking for commentary. So it wasn't just yes, no answers. We were asking for, uh, for commentary. And if you've read the full report or if you would like it, we can get the full report to you afterwards. A lot more commentary in the report uh, from the superintendents. When we asked this question about employee benefits, uh, we got quite a lot of commentary from superintendents saying, well, I don't get any benefits. You know, you've listed all of these benefits that you're asking me if I receive. And actually now I feel really bad because I don't get any of these benefits at all. Now we know the reality of that is that there will be some superintendents out there who don't receive uh, what, what we might call benefits, if you like. But we also know that there will be employees out there who probably don't understand or are not familiar with the benefits which they actually are entitled to. Um, and, and as someone who interviews people a lot of the time, I'm often interviewing senior people in the maritime sector, and they don't know what their benefits are. So, you know, maybe it's a communication piece, or maybe there are people out there who are just not very well rewarded on the benefit piece. So that was 11%, that, that group that I'm talking about, 11% of superintendents say they're not receiving any benefits at all. Big group of people. So we looked at bonus and we wanted to, to look at bonus and say, okay, of your overall reward, what percentage of that was made up of bonus? And what was that percentage? We wanted to look at that uh, between ship owners uh, and ship managers and say, okay, how does that look? And you can see here that um, we've got this big group of people here in ship owners and ship managers, 37% and 39% respectively, uh, who are receiving bonus, uh, and the bonus is, is less than 10%. But then also on the left-hand side here, if you look at ship owners, at the bottom there, we've got 12% uh, of superintendents working for ship owners have received a bonus of over 25%. What we hear and what we see and, and what we experience a lot of here is the dry bulk and the container sector again. We've heard some, some big numbers of superintendents being paid some big bonuses uh, in dry bulk and, and uh, container shipping. And, uh, and again, I think that's a reflection of, of what the markets have been doing. So we wanted then to, to look at bonus and say, OK, well, we understand what bonuses are being paid, but how does that look regionally? What does that look like uh, across the kind of the, you know, the, the global marketplace that is the maritime sector? And you can see here there's some big regional differences between Asia Pacific uh, uh, and Europe, for example. You can see that there's some big differences between the Middle East uh, and Asia Pacific. You know, there are some interesting stats here. I'm not going to spend too much time going through this in, in great detail. We don't have time uh, to drill down on it today, but the full report looks at this more closely and looks at uh, the makeup of bonuses and there's a lot more commentary available on that. Okay, so then just as a headline really, which is that 
Superintendents in Asia Pacific were the most likely to receive a bonus, and superintendents in Europe were the least likely to receive a bonus. Uh, now, so that there's been some interesting discussion post survey about the 13th month in Singapore. You know, you, is that 13th month in Singapore? Is it bonus? Is it not bonus? Uh, is it part of uh, fixed remuneration? Is it contractual? Is it not contractual? And, uh, and that certainly will have had an influence on people's view of whether or they do or don't receive bonus. Uh, but again, what we see here and what we experience is that European-based superintendents are much less likely to receive a bonus. So when moving into engagement, we wanted to understand how superintendents uh, really feel about uh, the companies they work for. Um, and, and really, you know, how engaged are they by the organisations that, that they work for? And I think it's interesting here that we've got the, these two big numbers, very valued and somewhat valued, which makes up, you know, 85% of superintendents. So we're saying 85% of these superintendents either feel very valued or somewhat valued. But I guess you could look at that slightly differently and say somewhat valued and not at all valued should be put together. And you could say, well, actually, 59% of superintendents, they're not entirely happy. You know, they're, they're really not feeling the love for whatever reasons, whether that's because they're in that group who haven't had a pay rise, uh, or whether they're in that group who don't receive any benefits, or whether it's other reasons. You could say that, you know, if you're not very valued and you don't feel like you're being bear hugged by your employer, then you're in that other group. And if you're in that other group, then you're probably a, a group that is at risk of leaving. And so I think that's a bit worrying in terms of the statistic itself, that we've got this big group of people, 59%, who are, you know, they're either sat on the fence, they're either kind of, you know, some days they're in, some days they're out, or they're not at all valued, at, not, or they don't feel at all valued. We asked our, our audience, are you planning to change jobs in the next 12 months? A huge, huge number, 80%. We've never seen a number as high as this before. Bearing in mind that the, the people who surveyed this, this isn't uh, people who are um, active job seekers who are applying to fast stream for a job. This is uh, people through social media. This is people through uh, our wider networks. It, it had a, you know, a, a big reach in terms of the survey itself and that 80 percent of people who are saying that they're planning to change jobs uh, in the next 12 months that's a that's a worrying number i think for the, the sector as a whole um i, I presented this at the same singapore recently and uh, one of my clients said that uh, indeed which is the big um, job board group in well they're a global american job board group but they did a survey uh, in singapore and a similar number came out across um, Singaporeans in all vacancy types. We've all read about the kind of the great resignation, um, very high profile at the moment around the skill shortages that, uh, that all sectors are facing, not just the maritime sector. And I think it's fair to say, you know, post COVID, people are much more active now, um, not just superintendents, but much more actively looking at changing jobs. People sat tight during COVID, so for the last you know, couple of years, people have sat tight, they've looked for a safe port in a storm, uh, they've stayed with the organisations that they're with, and now they feel that coming out the other side of COVID, that it's time to, to make a change. And we're certainly seeing much, much higher uh, candidate activity than we have done in a number of years. So we wanted to say, okay, these people who say that uh, they're thinking about changing jobs, where do they sit in the demographics? You know, how, how do they stack up? Well, we can see that uh, the, the big group of these people are the under one year and the one to three year group. Um, we know that superintendents are at their most vulnerable uh, when they first come ashore. We know that uh, younger people in the workplace are much more likely to change jobs more frequently. Uh, again, we're, we're all well read about the millennials and uh, Generation Z and the average tenure of, you know, two years in a job before they move on to the next job and, and how people are much more likely to have many more jobs in their career than ever before. 
and that gives you a good indication here. And then as you come up through, we've got this big group, 11 years plus. OK, big percentage still who are thinking of changing jobs, but uh, but nowhere near as big as the, uh, the, the guys and girls who are in their um, you know, early, earlier careers, if you like. So we said, OK, well, what is it that's motivating you to, uh, to want to change jobs? Um, Unsurprisingly, 28% said better salary and benefits. Well, you've got to reckon that um, many of those people will be people who didn't receive a pay rise or don't receive any benefits. You've got this group here, 27%, who think that actually uh, to achieve career progression, I, I need to change jobs. You know, I can't achieve the career progression that I want to achieve uh, with my current organization. Uh, to achieve my goals, I need to change jobs. We've got this group here who uh, see that they want a better work-life balance. 23% are saying, look, yeah, I'm going to change jobs because I can improve my work-life balance here. And then you can see uh, relocation of job security. But interestingly, we've still got this 5% here who say, well, I'm not aligned with my current company's culture and values. There's a disconnect uh, between the two. And I think that uh, we'll see that percentage increase. I think as more young people enter the maritime sector, I think we'll see that number go up and I think the importance of uh, culture and values in organisations and getting those right and communicating them uh, to, uh, to our employees will be more than ever important and will be something that we see um, as being a, a big factor for the choices people make to, to change jobs going forward. So what motivated people to stay in their current jobs? So the people who actually said, well, you know what, I'm not going to change jobs. What motivated them to, to stay in their current job? Well, 35% said, well, actually, it's work-life balance. You know, it's obviously pretty good for those, uh, those people. They feel good about their work-life balance. They're going to stay where they are. Salary and benefits still figures high, but I thought this one was interesting. And again, I don't know if this is a reflection of post-COVID, but relationships with colleagues and management. Again, this has never figured in any of our other reports before as being an important factor. But this whole relationship piece, working with people who you enjoy working, working with management who you connect with and you respect, seems to be more important than ever. I guess this is the old adage of kind of um, teams that play together are teams that stay together. And I think there's, a, there's an element of this. And I think, you know, ship management is a stressful sector. It's a, it's a stressful job. Uh, as it is, I think if you work with people who you enjoy working with and who you respect and management you respect, it's got to make what is a stressful job uh, somewhat easier. And then we see this company uh, culture and values piece as, uh, as being really important here. We looked a little bit at uh, travel post-COVID. So pre-COVID, um, and for many years, travel has been one of the, the big things for superintendents, one of the big topics. I travel too much, you know, I've come ashore and I'm now away from home and away from my uh, my family more than ever before. And I'm a superintendent, but I'm shore based. And, you know, we, we would hear this a lot. So we wanted post COVID to say, OK, well, you know, how has COVID impacted people? Um, and it's fair to say, like most of society, people fell into two groups. They fell into the kind of the group of you know, we, we can't travel, we mustn't travel, the, the, you know, the, the restrictions are too much and we must stay at home and, and do these things. And then the other group is, you know, we just need to get on with it. And there's this comment bottom right says, we just need to get on with the job now. You know, we've got these two very big groups of people, but lots of interesting commentary uh, in the actual report itself about how superintendents feel about their travel post COVID. Lots of interesting commentary around technology uh, and organisations embracing technology um, to, to kind of uh, get around travel restrictions and to be able to continue to, to manage ships during the post-COVID era. To stress, so we said, OK, well, what are the top three reasons that, uh, that, that you get stressed as a superintendent? Management style, 29%. Workload, 20%, and work-life balance, 15%. I think it's fair to say all three of these are interconnected. I don't think these are things necessarily that you can look at in, in isolation. I think they are intrinsically linked. And I think that uh, when you, again, read the commentary around uh, 
um, management style and some of the feedback that we received about workload and work-life balance. Very, very interesting reading about how superintendents feel about uh, some of these topics. Um, here, were, here were some of the sound bites that we were actually able to publish uh, on the event list. There was some very, um, I think, salty language is how I would describe it um, in terms of the superintendents and their, their feelings about some of the, uh, the, the stress factors. So we wanted to ask superintendents uh, uh, really about how they felt today about the shipping industry as a whole. And it was good to, to report that 75% of superintendents, superintendents said they would recommend their career to young people. I think that's a heartwarming statistic. You know, given everything that's been said and given you know, how tough this job is, 75% of superintendents would actually say to young people, you know what, this is a good career. And again, we had a lot of uh, very interesting and warm uh, feedback from superintendents about their career choice and why being a superintendent is such a good career choice. Lots and lots of commentary again. Um, we talked to them about how they expect to be managed. And again, I won't drill down on that today. We haven't got time to go into that in too much detail, but 71% of superintendents said that, you know, this has really changed the way in which uh, we expect to be led by business leaders. And, uh, and again, lots of feedback around their thoughts and feelings around this kind of post-COVID world and how they expect uh, to be led differently in the world that, that, that is now post-COVID. And I think, you know, if, you read, if you're out there, you're reading stuff and you're talking to people, this is a, a theme. You know, people have a lot of time to think during COVID. People are behaving differently post-COVID or coming out of COVID. And, uh, and that reflects in, in every aspect of life, but also it re reflects in the workplace. You know, we're an organization of 100 people and uh, you know we're tiny by comparison to some of the, the, the big ship management and ship owning organizations but my people here in fast stream um, they expect to be led differently by me post covid and because they have different thoughts and feelings about uh, about what the world looks like so to sum up some some final thoughts will we really see 80 percent of superintendents change jobs over the next 12 months um, my opinion of that is no, we won't. I think we will see uh, higher labour turnover rates than ever before. I think we're starting to see that already. Uh, I think that's a reflection, as I said, of people changing jobs um, post-COVID because they sat tight during COVID and didn't move. I think also it's a reflection of um, companies are finding it very difficult to recruit right now. And so there's a bit of a price war going on. And so we're starting to see um, significant pressure uh, on wages and companies are having to, to pay more to compete uh, for this talent that they find it difficult to recruit. So I think we're going to see much higher labour turnover rates in the shipping sector among superintendents, but I don't think it's going to be as high as 80%. Uh, can pay rises be a sustainable way to ensure people feel valued? I think pay rises um, are more of a hygiene factor. Uh, rather than you know the one thing that will drive people to change jobs but it is a reflection of how people feel if you haven't had a pay rise or you haven't had a pay rise for a very very long time without a doubt that is going to impact how you feel about the company you work for and so it is going to affect and impact whether or you do or don't feel valued and so it's going to be a factor Will company culture become an even more important part of retaining people in the future? Yes, I think it will. I think culture and values will become increasingly important, especially to young people who are entering the workforce. Uh, how will employers remain competitive? Well, they won't remain competitive simply uh, by, pay, by paying more money than, than other people. You know, one of the things we touched on at the beginning of the, or I touched on at the beginning of the presentation is, you know, 10% of the people, the superintendents we surveyed here, had never been to sea. And we're starting uh, in Europe and the UK to see that percentage increase. Superintendents have never been to sea. Superintendents who are naval architects or marine engineers uh, or mechanical engineers or electrical engineers or graduates who are being trained up. We're going to see more and more of that as the pool of, uh, in particular, European seafarers get smaller and smaller. We're going to see that skill pool that feeds into superintendents be more and more in demand, not just from uh, ship management, but from other sectors of maritime class or consultancy or 
OEMs, and we're going to see competition, I think, for uh, um, the talent who could be a superintendent has never been to see, naval architects and marine engineers, they're going to be very much in demand. Will travel return to normal levels? I just started traveling again recently and, uh, and I have to say it felt good. It felt really good to go out and shake people's hands and, and meet people and have you know physical interaction with, uh, with my clients and I think it will come back. I think it will come back. Are seafarers still the future? Well, as I touched upon, I'm not sure they're going to be in certain locations. I think it's going to be difficult. I think in other locations, you know, we talk about the pool of European seafarers uh, for European superintendent roles. We're, we're seeing the same thing in Singapore. You know, as it gets harder and harder to get a work permit in Singapore, are we going to see Singapore as a hub for superintendents coming into shoreside roles, having been at sea? Maybe not. Maybe it's going to change. And will leaders adjust their skills and style to, you know, kind of change to this new way of, of managing? Yes, I think they'll have to. I think they already are. I think some are doing a, a better job than others. It's the reality of that, but uh, for sure we're starting to see that. And then finally, how can the profession remain attractive to new generations of, of talent? Well, if 75% of our superintendents are, are positive sponsors, they're advocates of the industry as a whole, they're doing a good job being out there and uh, promoting the sector and hopefully that will continue. So let me just have this and close that. Thank you, Mark. Very good. So you should hopefully have the screen back, Cooper. Have you got the screen back? I've got a very odd screen because I'm seeing myself through your lenses, so I'm not sure this is intended. No, hopefully. Oh, no, OK, we're good. Right. I've stopped sharing, so hopefully you should have the screen now, Cooper. I do indeed. Lovely. Thank you very much. Now, obviously, I would like to open the floor. So if anybody has any question, please raise your hand electronically yellow or just put your visual so we can see your face. And meantime, I would have a question because, Mark, obviously, I read the report. And I was very, um, in, it was obviously the, the, every bit you were talking about is superb. Thank you, thank you, thank you for that. But somehow you shied away from sharing with us the technicalities of the job. For example, I was amazed when you shared the number of ships technical superintendents are looking. My gut feeling, and anybody I know would be three to four ships, and if LNG, maybe two. But you were saying in your report seven and above. Yeah. Could, could you go for this for a moment and explain what you've noticed there? Yeah, so it's interesting because, you know, obviously at any one time we're working with a lot of different organisations, both ship managers and ship owners. And uh, one of the things we're asking is about the number of ships that they expect the superintendents to manage. And so we thought it was interesting to look at this as part of the survey and say, OK, you know, how many ships are you actually managing as a superintendent? Because we, we see there the potential for the, a direct link between uh, stress and the pressure and responsibility that superintendents feel. Uh, and potentially, you know, is there a link between this and the number of ships that you're managing? I think it's fair to say that what we saw is, is a little bit unsurprising, I suppose, which is perhaps the more technically demanding ships uh, that superintendents are managing less of those and the ships that, and it's not for me to say, but the ships that some people might say are uh, more straightforward or simpler if you like, that superintendents are, are managing more of those, as many as up to seven, you know, and so when you start to look at um, the container ships and you start to look at things like perhaps some of the car carriers and even some of the dry bulk vessels, we see superintendents having a lot of ships that they're responsible for. Which is a bit, which is a bit pressure. It is, and I'm thinking immediately dry docking, uh, which you have to do, and it takes you away from your office and da da da. But anyhow, I just wanted to 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 make sure that we are not missing that. So your report has all of this. Yeah. Very good. Um, anybody would like to ask a question, please. Don't shy away. We've got opportunity. Yes, we do. Uh, Karsten, please. Uh, takes a while. 
Okay, now now I think it's it's there. Uh, hi, Mark. First of all, thank you very much for this report. I think it was excellent. I uh, I read it when it came out, and what I really liked is especially also that you are going into those soft skills a little bit more on on that side. What I would be interested in: Do you have any overview with regard to a nationality change with regard to superintendents? Have you seen that actually over the years we see that they are coming from different countries and that you see that the percentage is shifting? It's a good question. So the survey doesn't pick on pick on um, on that. Um, but what I have seen, and uh, and I'm sure others will have seen the same thing, is that uh, the vast majority in terms of the increasing percentage is is Indian superintendents. You know, I think that that is the the growing group of uh, superintendents, which I think directly reflects um, the world of seafarers and the skill the skill pool, if you like, uh, that feeds into becoming a superintendent. Historically and traditionally, the maritime sector has, and I'm sure will for many years to come, look to seafarers as the pool of uh, future superintendents, and the superintendent pool will reflect the changing demographics of seafarers. Um, having said that, we still see very few Filipino uh, superintendents. We still don't see very many at all. Um, we still see a relatively small number of Croatian superintendents compared to the number of, of Croatian seafarers. Uh, so it doesn't direct it doesn't directly link, but uh, there is a correlation between the the seafarers and the superintendent pool. And Karsten, I ask. Okay, go ahead. You've got another question. Go. Yeah, I got one more. One more. I mean, you were talking about superintendent, and you were looking at ship owners and ship managers. Yeah. I mean, looking uh, uh, to the industry, how much do you think is happening now from service providers? Uh, actually, that uh, people are shifting as a superintendent into uh, being service engineers, because I think this could be quite significantly. Yeah, Carsten, I think you make a very good point. Um, we think of uh, we think of ex seafarers as the majority of those people becoming superintendents, but the reality now is that many of those people can go to work for uh, original equipment manufacturers as service engineers. Many of those people can go work in classification societies uh, as surveyors. You know, there there are so many different uh, subsectors of the maritime industry. Uh, who are competing for that same talent, and especially so for superintendents who already have gained shoreside experience. Because once they've made that transition from ship to shore and they've gained that shoreside experience, they really are, a, you know, a, a hot, hot commodity, if you like, you know, as a, as a marketable group of people because so many different people want to work, want to employ them. Now, when you look at some of the new technology companies, whether this is companies who are making scrubbers or whether it's other maritime technology companies, they also want to employ these people as well. So the, the, the competition for that group or that talent pool, I think, is increasing. That's a very good point. Especially on this one, uh, I mean, you have been looking at the salaries of superintendent, ship owners and ship managers. I mean, especially uh, this, let's call it this competition, which is there. And also with regard to salaries and all the things could be quite interesting as well, because I would like to understand actually how we are standing as uh, ship managers, ship owners, actually in this whole whole system compared to our competitors, which are hunting for the same uh, same employees because this is this is really important for us. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, very good. And um, one thing which we have been discussing before with Mark actually was the uh, um, idea of what's happening now with Ukraine and Russia. And um, Mark, do you see any pressures because the Russians are not available? to perform the duties, for example, in Cyprus or Ukrainians not being able to travel, but on superintendency. Uh, is this registering with you now? Um, I would say that um, they, as a group, as a nationality group of superintendents, that uh, the Russian and Ukrainian uh, superintendents is a, still a relatively small um, part, part of, uh, of that group. And so I don't think it's fair to say that we've seen any big impact on superintendents so far, but not that I've experienced. And related message and, and, and question here, actually, because of COVID, do you see 
new people getting into the market less willing to relocate. They are now demanding that they can actually work from home from the domestic places. And yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, very much so. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on this, wanting to be remote, wanting to remain in their home country, uh, a lack of willingness to relocate, uh, and a, a general trend, I would say, coming out of COVID that continues of expatriates uh, who want to come home. You know, we still see that a lot of uh, you know, Europeans who are in Singapore or uh, Hong Kong in particular, uh, who want to leave and come home. And I think that's, a, again, that's a reflection of people not being, not having to, um, or not having been able to travel easily and see their families easy, and now wanting to come home and spend time back in, in Europe or with their home country. Um, being watchful for yellow hands anywhere, uh, my final question from myself is, how likely are you to work with us and do the same on personal officers, HR departments? Uh, that's a, that's a, a, a niche within a niche, Cooper. That's uh, pretty. It's pretty specific. So the whole you're thinking the whole crewing piece and uh, an HR and personnel piece. Yeah, I don't think that would be too difficult for us to do. We have access to those people globally. I think we have access to be able to do that. We could probably do something with you on that. I would love to see that and especially then compare how much we are paying these people who are responsible for the same amount of budget on the ship, 55% yeah. as technicals, and how much do we pay these people who are dealing with humans uh, in the end of the day. And I would be superbly interested. I would I would kill for it. To, to <laughs> Very good. We'll have to see if we can help you with that one, Cooper. And that would be great, obviously, and I'm pretty sure we would energize our members who would like to, to see that. I, I, um, I've rushed through the report today, but if anyone would like a copy of the report, then just drop me a note through LinkedIn or Google will share my details if you want the full report itself, which goes into much more detail uh, than I could cover in, in today's presentation. But the time today just didn't allow and I, I had to talk fast. Oh, you're a fast stream. So, <laughs> And uh, I have to put my hands up. I made a, a mistake, spelling mistake when introducing Mark in my messages. I missed two letters in the fast stream. And Mark was called Fast Stream. I've so been called I'm much worse, Cooper. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind, sir. Uh, not seeing any further questions to Mark. Any anything for me for inter manager? Any homework? Any issues you would like to share with other members, please? No. So the guillotine can come eight minutes earlier today. Then, Mark, thank you for being with us. Superb re report. Please. Pass our best regards to your team because it was a huge teamwork and very well presented, very well well done. So thank you. And the next meeting in two weeks' time on Wednesday. We'll come back to the Wednesday meeting then. Thank you, everyone. And I'll be recording. Well, this has been recorded and recording will be available for you very shortly. So I'm stopping recording now and saying goodbye, everyone.